how is it mm -hmm. perfect uh how does it fit into your education what you want out of a, a sort of extension education course uh and then we're going to do a little bit of work uh sort of give you a taste of what it's like to be a designer in these courses uh kind of give you a nice uh sort of dip your toe in the deep end kind of uh, exercise uh leave you with something uh for attending this uh, little webinar uh and then we'll close out with uh questions and some comments and stuff all right so a little bit of an introduction of who i am uh, my name is Alex Stewart, and I've been an instructor at McEwen for the last five, six years. Um, I sort of came here after finishing my master's degree uh, at the Rhode Island School of Design in uh, Digital Media, um, and have helped largely build out this program uh, with the McEwen staff uh, as we've sort of created this digital experience design pathway. Uh, yeah. So the certificate program itself uh, is four courses that bring in the fundamentals of uh, digital design. So this has changed a lot over the last 10 years. Uh, and if you've used or seen terms like user experience design, UX design, UI design, uh, digital designer, uh, it is trying to cover a lot of those fundamentals so that you can participate in those fields, although it is becoming very fragmented and different and it's constantly changing uh, over time, and we've tried to be strategic about the things we teach um, so it can prepare you for that world. Uh, it's an in person uh, class. Uh, we've done a little bit of uh, remote delivery over the course of the pandemic, um, but we are uh, wholly committed to the in person training, to getting people in front of other people uh, to make that connection, to make communication strong. Uh, and because a lot of what we do is visual, a lot of what we do is engaged with people, uh, problem solving, uh, and that is the skills we are developing in the course. Uh, we are not doing any coding in the classes. If you're coming into this thinking, oh, I need to know how to code to do, you know, to design apps or websites and things like that, uh, not required. Certainly is an asset if you've got that information. And we'll be talking a little bit about what the code does and how it affects the design process. Uh, but we won't be doing any actual coding. Uh, it's not a hurdle uh, that you need to jump over. Uh, Continuing education program, uh, these certificates that you would take as part of the DXDI course uh, mirror a lot of the stuff that happens at the university level uh, in the main uh, degree programs at McEwen. Uh, and so the this continuing education uh, course has been developed alongside the uh, pathways in the Bachelors of Design. And this was done in order to uh, maintain a consistency between what we teach. Um, it is a particular perspective on digital design that we have. Um, and it's also trying to create a very cohesive community in, in Edmonton around what do people know, what are the skills people have, and what can people expect when they hire somebody who has those skills. Uh, it's also something that we can do to uh, improve the courses as well. We get lots of feedback both from people in university level programs about how well or or uh, uh, how challenging the, the material is. We also get a lot of people who are returning to school, uh, the more mature students in the continuing education program, and they do a lot to inform us about what they have seen, what is important to them, and we can bring that also down to the university level. This curriculum, all of this material, uh, has been developed by uh, myself, uh, as well as Robert Andruko, who leads the design department at McEwen. Um, he came into the role from a sort of digital design background um, and sort of led a fairly successful uh, web design company um, dealing primarily with nonprofits. Um, and Isabel Sperano, who comes to us from Laval, uh, where she did her PhD um, and has done a, an extensive amount of teaching in digital design. Uh, and so is a major asset uh, and a, an incredible uh, uh, get for our program to have somebody like that uh, join us. And then Michael Lucio, who is another uh, sessional faculty, uh, as well as a uh, uh, local design practitioner in the digital uh, community here in Edmonton. Uh, and amongst the group of us uh, have developed a lot of the material uh, collated what we thought was important, put it all together into a strategy, uh, and have presented that in the course material here. Uh, in these programs, 
you'll work on projects created to be both relevant locally and in a wider context. Uh, and what this means is that when you work on stuff in these courses, uh, you're not just working on something that might be relevant to say a Google person, but there's no jobs here in Edmonton. But also on the flip side, we also don't want to teach you how to do things that would be relevant to Edmonton. But then as soon as you leave Edmonton or you talk to somebody from somebody else, they don't know what you're talking about. So we've tried to be very specific about what we're trying to get you to do and that it can be a bridge into a job uh, with a local design firm or with a digital agency here in Edmonton, but also could be a stepping stone into uh, maybe getting an internship with Google or potentially moving on to Toronto where there's a much bigger uh, tech scene there. Uh, the structure and content of the program has been developed over the last five years uh, and in direct conversation with uh, local design professionals. So specifically here, I've called out Yellow Pencil, uh, who do a lot of really great work uh, uh, with a lot of the same values that we teach here at McEwen, um, you know, very involved in research and understanding people and creating things that are good for people and not just good products. Uh, they do a lot of work with the government and some nonprofit stuff. Uh, and that extends also to the Digital Innovation Office, um, who uh, are, are working primarily underneath the Alberta government. They do a lot of work to uh, modernize, digitize a lot of the old processes that the government had, uh, things like the child care subsidy. Uh, a couple of years ago, if you wanted to apply for a child care subsidy, you had to fill out paper forms, you had to go to an office and drop it into a mail slot and then wait weeks and no, you know, have no idea what's going on with your application. Uh, and a lot of that stuff was just rooted in really old practices that weren't very humane. And so people at the Digital Innovation Office came in and have started to uh, update and digitize a lot of what government does. Uh, and it's a lot of their needs for intelligent and caring designers that have created the need for this program. Uh, all right. Uh, you'll be learning if you join us at Allard Hall, our new facilities in downtown Edmonton. Um, if you have ever been to the downtown McEwen campus, uh, it's sort of way on the west end of that strip of buildings. You can see in the sort of the map there. Um, and we have brand new facilities there. Uh, we'll primarily be teaching in sort of a computer lab space uh, in this building. Uh, really nicely appointed, uh, highest grade uh, air filtration, uh, if that uh, uh, is a concern of yours coming into an in-person learning environment in 2022. And the uh, uh, building itself, nice and um, uh, accessible for all of your needs, whoever you might be, um, and uh, adequate parking around there as well, uh, if you're worried about how to get there. So this is a little overview of the four courses. It starts with DxD 101. Uh, and then uh, in that first course, we try to bring you up to speed on a lot of the terms, um, some of the basic skills, uh, uh, primarily rooted around research and trying to articulate what should be done to solve problems for people. Uh, and that helps transition into uh, the second course, DxD 102, which is more about understanding what the specifics of the platform do to inform your decisions as a designer. The platform being, uh, in this case, uh, smartphones. So understanding a little bit more about what smartphones are doing and how you can sort of utilize that to de de uh, deliver better products. So 101 is about websites primarily. Uh, 102 is about mobile apps. So the two sort of major ecosystems of uh, digital products uh, currently. And then DXDI 103, we start to get a little bit more into understanding uh, user input, understanding that interaction is not just us putting something in front of somebody, them clicking a button, but actually it's more of a conversation. And so we get a little bit more into the, the nitty gritty, the, uh, uh, the more interesting interactions that happen when you create something for somebody that's meant to be clicked on and interacted with uh, over time. Uh, and then that leads into the final course uh, where we start to try and culminate a lot of the skills and techniques that we've developed over the last three uh, and give you a little bit more self-direction in what you want to be designing for. Uh, it's where we kind of open the gates a little bit and let you go into things that are a little bit more uh, responding to changes in the industry currently, uh, trends in consumer uh, uh, interaction and 
uh, you know, things that might be related to social media or new technologies, uh, new ways that people are adopting digital technology. In the last couple of years, uh, students have been looking to the effect of the pandemic on projects. Um, and so what kinds of stuff would be <clears throat> needed or necessary for people to solve their problems uh, in the years to come. So this is where we start to bridge what is currently into what is about to happen you know, just around the corner. Uh, all right. Uh, to reiterate a little bit, we'll be working on uh, websites and apps, giving you some fundamental skills. Uh, this is an example of a student project here from uh, a past student. Um, one of the things we try and get people to work on is an app for the Parks Canada system. Um, and there's a lot of consistency in terms of what projects you work on from uh, 101, 102, and 103. And they all take the form of digital products. That's really the kind of premise that we work underneath of. We are building digital products. But the point is that we're trying to understand why things should be designed the way they are. That the graphics on the screen is just a means to an end. And so the things that we're going to be teaching you that, that are these sort of understanding the values behind design, the strategies for how we create things that are good, regardless of whatever platform you're designing on, uh, so that you can take the skills you understand and learn for websites and apply them into apps, understanding where they're applicable and where, where smartphones are potentially different, and then take those same uh, adaptive patterns and bring them into other platforms, other software, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, things that are just sort of coming out that seem very novel and new and kind of unknown, but there's a lot of stuff we've learned from the past, other more well-established platforms, we can then uh, bring those no that knowledge forward. So you'll work on a lot of things like that. Uh, that this program itself is born out of a need to create better designers, people who have a better understanding uh, of what needs to be designed, uh, that we have the opportunity but also the, 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 the time is now to create things that people uh, uh, need and that make their lives better. I'm sure we've all experienced the last couple of years in increased time spent online. Uh, there's been some research in the past that has indicated that our brains kind of think about our smartphones like a, an appendage, an extension of our physical bodies that we've kind of internalized our digital selves so much that you know, we can't really detach. And so the, 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 the requirement of designers to create something good becomes a kind of imperative. We have to make these things better because they're so much a part of our lives. Uh, a couple of data points here and how that's kind of accelerated over the last couple of years, even before the pandemic, uh, we were spending a lot of time uh, online, uh, about, you know, 3.5 hours of dedicated digital time uh, that has sort of increased to uh, over five hours a day uh, uh, during the pandemic. Some people may have changed over the last little while as we kind of transition into uh, the new sort of long tail of the pandemic, um, but we will see some constant changes. It's one of the, na the natures of our industry that is constantly changing and fluctuating and that we uh, are always constantly changing our relationship to digital technologies, but it has come to the point where even small things that don't work in our digital products become major issues for people, major pain points and things that really drastically affect their quality of life. So if something is frustrating for you, you will probably not want to use that product anymore. You'll find something else, or maybe you'll internalize it. You'll just like constantly have this low level of uh, 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 friction in your life all the time. So we wanna try and develop things that uh, resolve some of that smooth out some of that friction, alleviate some of those pain points. Yeah. So our course is about learning what makes a good design. Something can be beautiful and sort of, I think this is the major assumption people have about design, that design is about making things that are beautiful. But sometimes beautiful things don't actually work. They don't actually do what we want them to do. Uh, this has sort of been the major uh, tension point in design for a very, very long time aesthetics versus function, uh, and that things should look the way that they are intended to behave and function. But we also have things that do work now, 
I'm sure we've all had this experience where we have things that do perform their function, but kind of suck when they are used. You have a hammer that has a bad handle. You have a, a smartphone that constantly is making you feel like you're being badgered all the time. It's sort of a screenshot here uh, that somebody posted of all of the little like red dots, these like little, almost like, uh, uh, um, uh, they're almost like sores or scars on the surface of your phone, sort of like, you know, they're screaming at you, hey, there's something you need to take notice of. This is all part of a bad experience for people. And so we want to develop skills as designers for addressing the things that feel bad, that make us feel uh, uh, hounded by our technologies or that, you know, kind of rankle a little bit as we use them or something that we come away from that experience feeling anything less than joy. This is what we try to do because anything that doesn't work, anytime that there's a, a glitch or you know you did something wrong in a product, that's the product's fault. It's a bad design. It's not your fault as a user. And this is what we're trying to get at. So the core value of a user experience or digital experience design program. So I'm gonna ask you a question here, comparing these two, these two products. Uh, on the left-hand side here is uh, a somewhat uh, a previous version of Microsoft Word. Uh, and the example on the right-hand side is uh, Apple Pages. Both essentially the same function. Um, they are a word processor, uh, the sort of logical successor of uh, the typewriter, allowing you to put words down on a virtual piece of paper. And I just want you to compare for a moment. We'll come back to this in a second, but just think like which one of these is better than the other? Which one of these has a better experience than the other? And this word experience is something that gets a little fuzzy sometimes. It's kind of all encompassing. It tackles so many other issues. It's hard to kind of understand like what is experience, but just for yourself from this moment right now, what is a better experience? And I'm going to come back to this in a second. Uh, here. Uh, oh, I see here from uh, in the Q&A, uh, Fahad loves Apple Pages and Keynote, speaking from experience. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great little response to that. So to understand how to address experience in the term, as the term is applied to what we do here, is that good technologies or technologies that have good design should respect who we are as people, as human beings. Uh, the next, good design and good technologies should also respect where we live. So this is an understanding that there is context, right? So not just who we are and what we try to do, but also where we are that who I am at home is different from who I am at work, but there's a deep level of understanding we need to, need to have that it's not just enough to know, oh, I know who my user is, but do you know what their life is like? This is important. And then our good designs should also understand what we want, what motivates us as users. So whenever we design anything for people, we have something that understands those deep drivers uh, and this is important to understand if something is a good or bad experience. All right, so here's where I'm gonna get into a little bit more of the uh, universal understanding of experience. How do we approach experience as designers uh, beyond simply just the conceit of digital products? It's not just about making apps and websites, but it's about being understand what makes good design. So here is a very common experience lots of people have uh, traveling uh, in a plane going somewhere else. Um, it's something that we have not done a lot of over the last couple of years, uh, but there is lots of data pointing to a massive resurgence in air travel uh, as, as the world becomes uh, uh, more and more uh, functional again. And so there's a bunch of things that we can probably bring in, uh, to the table an understanding of what makes uh, a, a an air travel experience for ourselves. Uh, it's something for most people somewhat beyond the normal. Uh, it's a, a focal point of your year. Generally, most people don't do more than one uh, air travel time a year. Uh, and so it's special. It should feel special. 
uh, it's also something that's fairly alien. People are going to be generally kind of uncomfortable because it's not something they do all the time. Uh, it's highly anticipated, so there's a lot of expectation going into it. You might be going on vacation, and so you're not just thinking about the travel itself, but also what you'll be doing when you get to that destination. Maybe you're visiting family, and there's a sort of big uh, 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 expectation and maybe a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of dread, you know, that family comes with some very complex feelings uh, sometimes, oftentimes. So these all go into that person's experience of uh, air travel. Uh, beyond the sort of uh, uh, stuff that people bring with them to that experience, there's also the things in the moment that they're thinking about the connecting flight. So it's not just one plane, there's maybe multiple planes, multiple stages of uh, travel. There's Question of like, well, can I sleep on this plane? Am I be able? To, I'm going to be able to get to where I need to go. Do I have to be awake and aware of what's going on when I'm outside of my, you know, comfortable bubble at this moment? There's the qualities of the air. There's the way that people feel uncomfortable or potentially uncomfortable. Things smell weird, or you know, especially now after the pandemic, people are very conscious of the air around them. And so these are all factoring into the way that that person perceives that space. And so when we're designing for that particular person, we need to be able to bring an understanding of what that experience is like for them. Because we can't just design something that solves a problem in the moment. It has to understand the full realm of that person's experience. So here's the experience problem, that in order to design good experiences, we need to be able to understand people, that we study their behavior and their psychology. We bring a lot of understanding from uh, uh, the sort of psychology and social sciences fields into our design course. Some basic premises that allow us to understand uh, why people make the choices they make. But we also want to ask ourselves questions about why would somebody make the choice? When do people ask the question, what connecting flight do I need to make? Am I going to be late? Do I have enough time? When do those questions come up? And how can I put the information in front of that user? And I need to be able to reconcile both the information I'm getting from actual science and psychology and the things that real people are saying. A big part of what we do in our courses is talk to real people because it's the only way to understand what is going to work for them. When you don't do this, and I think we've been seeing a lot of this in the news lately, uh, we have experiences that don't work, that might have the functions that are, their functions are there, Right, There are people who are successfully getting through Pearson Airport right now, but the experience is bad. And we see this a lot in social media right now. I don't have to dig very hard to find people's responses to this. You know, uh, this person, Almir, just absolute chaos coming home. No organization, no one giving direction, lines barely moving. Now, is this actually something that has not been organized? No, there's somebody who did a lot of work to organize Pearson Airport. There's a lot of people who put a lot of time into designing Pearson Airport to be functional, but it breaks down. It's not working because it does not understand how people are going to actually be behaving and interacting in that space. So for ourselves, when we're designing for anything, whether it be an app or an air travel experience, we have to ask a particular question. What does the user need? What, is their, what are their core needs? What can we do to give them what they are looking for? Right, so if they're thinking about that connecting flight, what do they need? Oh, they need to know what flight they're connecting to and how to get there. How much time do they have? Do they have enough time to get there? Some of the best things I've seen in airports in the recent past is people saying, how long is it gonna take you to walk from where you are to that connecting terminal? That's huge for alleviating people's fears because if you don't know how long it's gonna take you, you might feel like you need to rush when in reality, you might be able to take a small break, grab some food, maybe have a little bit of a, a sort of quieter, more uh, uh, luxurious experience at the airport versus something that feels very rushed and hurried and you're kind of building your anxiety by the time you get to the, air, to the plane you're connecting to, you have to sit around and wait anyway. So people having the information they need in front of them is important. So we can and should strive for good designs that improve the lives of people. And I think you're starting to get an understanding of what that means at this point. 
by asking questions and bringing in some knowledge of how people behave, we can kind of create interactive systems that give people what they're looking for when they're looking for it. Intelligently giving them something. That's what design is. It's not about making things that are look pretty, although that's sometimes a part of it. It's all about giving people things that help them when they need that help. But uh, yeah, go back one, yeah, one more, one more minute. But the big thing here is that people, any, any person is a complex person uh, and designing for people is never gonna be simple. And so we use a lot of things uh, that help us make sense of the complexity. It's a big part of what we do in this program. And so you see one of the things we use a lot uh, on the right-hand side here, a little bit of a sort of pictorial framework we try to break down a very complex system like the, the airport example into something that can be kind of chunked down and made a little bit more uh, accessible for the designer. Uh, you try to break down who you're designing for as a persona, as a kind of derivation of all the user inputs you've received, the people you talk to, the trends you've observed, some psychology stuff, and you compact it into uh, a representation of, that, of those people. You fit that into a scenario. And that scenario could be uh, just riding on the airplane, but more likely you're trying to fit in the whole context. The motivation that drove somebody to take that plane, the destination they're headed towards, and the experience in the moment. And then articulating the goal. What is the successful accomplishment of this activity look like? Why are they doing it? Because somebody traveling for business is something different than somebody traveling for fun. And we can design things with an understanding of what those two different experiences are like. So if you wanted to define what an experience is, the experience is the why, the what, and the how of the product. And this might seem a little obvious, but when we think about how broad the term experience could be, this is really helpful. And we understand why something should be designed the way it is. We look at the what of the situation. And we look at how, how are we going to be delivering uh, a good experience for people? Uh, this material comes from the uh, Interaction Design Foundation. You see a sort of representation of the website here. Um, uh, lots of great stuff from uh, that website find themselves into our uh, program. So little tidbits, small little articles, and some videos that help punctuate a lot of stuff we're learning with something that fits into a larger defined context of what is user experience and interaction design. So here, if we get back to the thing that started this, we, you know, we design apps, we design websites, we design software solutions for things like virtual reality. When we say those things, most people just think the screen, the graphics, the buttons on the screen, the letters, the colors. This graphic stuff, this UI, user interface, is just a means to an end. When we design things, for, design products, we are trying to design the situation, the scenario, and we do that through the screen. It's our tool, but it's not the goal. So this is what we do when we design things in our program. And this is also why our program is very accessible to people. You don't have to be a master of design. You don't have to be uh, 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 sort of a beautiful artist crafting things that are uh, you know, super lush graphical representations. You don't have to be an illustrator. You don't even have to have color theory coming into this because we will teach you all the things you need to know to create compelling experiences for people. And we'll allow you to, we'll give you the tools to do that. Uh, as digital experience designers, we try to anticipate the user, what the user is expecting to see when they first arrive at our screens. That information is then presented as the graphics. At any given moment, the information that is most important to the users should be the easiest thing to find. And so this is as true on the, the surface of your smartphone as it is wandering an airport. Next time you go to a grocery store, think about the design of that grocery store. Is the thing that you as a user that you're most hoping to see, is it presented in front of you? Is the layout of that grocery store readable? Can you find from looking around what you're looking for? Or do you just end up wandering up and down the aisles, kind of trying to figure out, okay, what was that thing I was looking for? What was the thing I was you know, told to get on the way home from work? These things are the questions we ask as designers and help us understand what is a good or bad experience for people. So we come back to this example. Microsoft Word on the left 
uh, pages on the right. Uh, and we come back here. So Lisa in the comments here said, I prefer Microsoft's model because more choices are displayed. Yeah. So maybe in the in the comments here, if you can, uh, leave some comments similar to what Fahad said, what Lisa said. What is your response to these two products? Which one has a better experience? But take a moment and just think about the prompts we were just talking about. Think about the user, not simply just your own perspective, but for the user, which one presents a better experience? What are some conventions that you might be able to uh, uh, talk about in this? Things that are recognizable, that let you know what you need to see uh, uh, as a designer and as a user, what do you need to see on screen to let you do the thing you're trying to use the software for? You know, how discoverable is the content? If you need to change a piece of text and then change its color or change its size, how easy it to, is it to find the button that does that? And then as the last sort of bullet point, how empowering is this for the user? How much power to make choices, to do things that are incredible, does this allow, the, uh, does it give the user? This is sort of that last, kind of intangible quality of things that take something from, uh, oh yeah, this kind of works. It's as useful and as commonplace as a door we walk through, right? You don't recognize when you walk through a door if the door works. You only recognize a bad door when it doesn't work. So in this case, you know, what takes this from a mundane normal experience into something extraordinary? Uh, so here in the comments, uh, Fahad says, in my experience, I prefer pages because the things that I need are right there. I can naturally navigate pages to get to where I need to go, see how it starts, and simple icons in the pages, and then goes down from there. Cool. And we can see that a little bit in the example on the right-hand side. It's a little bit low resolution, I'm sure, for all of us. But even at that low resolution, things stand out, right? That uh, Fahad mentioned the icons. Icons paired up with labels is a great way to get people to understand, oh, what am I looking for? Create something new. Or there's that little... Uh, pencil that is constantly used as an icon for creating something new. I'm going to click on that. That's going to be great. Whereas in, in uh, Microsoft, how do you create something new? Well, there might be a little icon that's very similar, uh, but the patterns sort of well-established on in Microsoft's uh, Word ecosystem is that you go to file, file new, you sort of go down a tree of steps, a um, few more steps than maybe most people are uh, willing to do, but some people who have grown up with Word, maybe potentially like Lisa, um, has has sort of an understanding of uh, what those conventions are and can jump into them more easily. It's not about one of these being better than the other. I sort of set up a false uh, split here. No one of these is actually better than the other. The reality is that for a certain user, one of these is a better one. Under a certain context, one of these was potentially better for a particular user. With a particular motivation, one of these is potentially more useful. Uh, Lisa says here at the bottom, the Apple version is more recommended for the elderly, ESL, rudimentary tasks, and stuff like that. And I think this is a great response. And it's not a slight against either Apple or Microsoft, but when you're looking at trying to get someone who's uncomfortable with technology, who doesn't have a lot of experience with technology, what would you recommend to them? Probably an Apple product, because Apple does a lot of work to make a lot of the information that people would need to see surface level, right? Right on the very surface of things so people don't have to dig too far. They also remove a lot of choice so that you don't have to get lost in choice as much. The example on the left-hand side from Microsoft uses something called the ribbon. The ribbon is the sort of convention of all the choices presented along the top here. And there's different like tabs you can press along the top to change what's visible on that ribbon. This is kind of uh, 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 problematic for people who don't know what buttons do and get very easily overwhelmed by choice. You get kind of that kid in the candy store syndrome where you know you could click on one thing but you don't really know what it does and is it different from this other thing and there's not always a label on it but if you know what you're doing if you know what you're looking for you you recognize those patterns you can click through and you can find what you're looking for very quickly it's potentially more empowering 
for people who recognize that and who have developed that skill. But for people who don't, so you're designing a word processor for uh, the elderly or for somebody who's learning English for the first time, you want something that doesn't uh, uh, hide as much of uh, what's going on. It makes things a little bit more obvious for people. So I think these two responses, Fahad and Lisa, both are very spot on with what you're talking about understanding the pros and cons of both of these, what makes this a good or bad experience for a particular user. And this is a lot of what we do uh, when we design things in uh, our digital experience design projects. So let's take another example here. A couple of minutes, let's just look at something entirely new. Uh, this is a website. Um, uh, in this case, two different websites. One uh, is the Weather Network, um, based out of the US, um, and one is the Environment of Canada uh, weather page, something you might have used in the past. And so here we have uh, a direct comparison. We can kind of get a gut level reaction. Which one of these is a better experience? And most people, uh, uh, I know because I've done the, the polls on this, um, most people would say the better experience is the one on the left. And there's a lot of a bias there. It feels a little bit more intentionally laid out. Uh, there's a little bit more of a graphical understanding of the frame of the, the window it's in, right? Feels more nicely laid out. There's some uh, uh, good borders, some very clear information, lots of use of color compared to the one from Environment Canada, which feels very stripped down, maybe a potentially older website. It's using some very old conventions from the web. Uh, but we can also ask, a few questions to get a little bit deeper. So the first question we wanna ask is, what motivated a person to come to this website? What were they hoping to find? They probably came from Google, right? Maybe in the, in the, question, in the uh, uh, comments here, what do you think the user Googled to get to this page? What were some things that might have been uh, asked of the internet to get them to, to this destination? Either one of these pages. Give people a minute to think. Uh, So here we can talk about the uh, the question like weather later today. So uh, this is often uh, also entered into Google with uh, your location. So you might say like Edmonton weather today, right? If you're like speaking to your Amazon Alexa or your Google Home, you might also be like, hey Alexa, what's the weather like today? I hope we didn't trigger anybody's Alexa. Apologies for that. Um, but the the, the, the understanding of those questions is important for us. So uh, we want to understand, okay, I want some information about what the weather's like, maybe right now, maybe later today. And so those are going to kind of prime that user to look for certain information. So they come to the one on the left and they immediately see a degree uh, of 31 degrees. And probably they understand, oh, that's the right now temperature, right? And maybe even they look at the window, makes sense, looks warm, looks kind of sunny, that makes sense. And they look down below and they see today's uh, uh, you know, projected temperature. This is appealing to that person, right? The one on the right, they might also think that, but then they go to see here and they immediately have to scroll down because part of the map is cut off. They don't see the exact information. If they do, I think it's a little bit in that blue bar there, kind of small. So the example on the left is doing something really important. It's that it made the thing that was the most important to the user, that understanding of temperature, it made it be the first thing they saw, kind of even subconsciously, they had to see that first thing rather than kind of digging for it a little bit on the right-hand side. Lisa says here, a traveler may prefer the example on the right. Uh, and that's potentially true because the information that's presented uh, uh, there as temperature and sort of, you know, weather general experience in term, in the term, uh, 
presented as an icon, so the sort of sun icon, is presented in a map, in a map where you can understand, oh, it is this in Edmonton, but it's something maybe the same or different in Calgary. And if you're traveling to Calgary, that would be incredibly important. Or if you're somebody who's more interested in uh, the specific microclimate of the place you're in, you might need something that's a little bit more map-based because weather changes over time, and weather here at the, where I live might be different from where the, the sort of weather radar is for my particular destination, which might be downtown or might be at the airport. And so it might not actually be close to where I am. And so depending on the goals of a particular user, one of these things might be better or worse. So what are the conventions here we can think about? The map is one of them, that's a convention. The sort of like projected temperature in different uh, sort of chunks uh, that you see on the left-hand side, the sort of 27 degrees with partly sunny, the 32 degrees with partly sunny, that presented in a row like that says, okay, this is a logical sequence because we are from the West, uh, we are in the West and we read things from left to right in the West. We logically understand this is a sequence, a linear sequence. It's a pattern that we can intuitive, intuitively understand even if we're not explicitly told so. So in terms of those things readily available, the one on the left is doing a lot of really great work. If we wanted to improve the one on the right to still do what it's doing, but adopt some of the best practices of the one on the left, we could pull up uh, the temperature, make it a little bit bigger, a little bit more front and center, we could potentially have the map appear a little bit higher in the page, a little bit more uh, centered on the screen so you don't have to scroll down to find it. And we could still have something that shows that sequence uh, so that it's still usable by somebody who isn't necessarily worried about the, the sort of location across Canada, but still wants to know that might still be helpful for them. So there's things we could pull from both of these that would really help improve a weather website if we were to build a new one. What else do you see here would be helpful if we were building an entirely new weather website? What would you pull from one of these that potentially helps improve the experience for the user? And this could be a convention, something that makes something discoverable, or something that feels empowering for the user. Uh, Fahad asked, can you say that again? So if this is a sort of classic thing in design, uh, we're looking at two examples here. And if your job was to create a third example, a new weather website, what would you want to pull from one of these that makes it a better experience, that would make it a good experience? So we've talked about the map and how that could be useful for some people. We've talked about the logical sequence that might be helpful for some people, making the temperature the first thing you see, making the icons big, uh, anything else that might be helpful for designing a good weather website. We might talk about color. Color is certainly something that draws you in very effectively. The one on the left having a lot of really good uses of color, but maybe we can use that color a little bit more effectively to address the, the, the uh, depiction of weather. So we could have that color associated with maybe time of day. If it's like really bright, it's like midday. If it's like uh, early morning or at, at night, it could sort of have that sort of sunset gradient like it kind of has. But maybe you could have it more associated with the temperature or with the, the weather itself so that you can just glance at it very quickly and get an understanding of the experience. How does that weather feel? Uh, <clears throat> Fahad said, uh, I would 100% pull the icons and graphical aspects uh, of the weather network as it communicates the information in a visual manner. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and also appreciating the segregation of the boxes, almost like a widget style interface. Yeah, very clear breakdown of the layout, right? Each one of those sort of what we call cards is a, a chunk of content that is a, something unique on that page. They are related to each other in some way, but everything inside each card is a unit. And we can start to create a logical understanding of, of a website through the use of that layout style. So a really strong uh, strategy that we see a lot in Google's 
uh, design strategy. And we touch on that a little bit in uh, DXDI 103. So utilizing those uh, methods to create layouts. Cool. All right. So uh, that should hopefully give you an understanding of what it's like to kind of work on these types of things uh, to create really good experiences for people, whether that be digital or in real life. Um, uh, sort of getting, leave the floor open for anyone who might have any questions about the program or about what we talked about today. Anything and anything you might, uh, everything and anything you might be uh, wondering at this moment. Uh, we have a couple minutes here before the end of the hour. So I would just share with anyone that's interested in the program. So I do have the link on this page here. It's mcewen.ca slash dxdesign. Um, if you go to mcewen.ca slash dxd, that will take you to the bachelor's degree uh, for, for design. Uh, DX design will take you to this uh, continuing education four course certificate program. Um, and the first course for anyone that's interested uh, starts on September 12th and it's Monday and Wednesday evenings. So if you're still working full time, uh, it's very accessible for you guys. Mm -hmm. We did also just recently remove the admission requirements for this program. Uh, you did have to apply previously. Um, and so this will be the first time where we have removed that barrier. So it's even more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need a portfolio. You don't need prior design experience. Uh, if you're curious about working in design or in tech, uh, this can be a great uh, low barrier for entry pathway into that world. Uh, oh, yeah, Lisa says, thanks so much for the introduction. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah, thank you very much, Fahad, for your uh, comments as well. Yes, and this session was recorded. Uh, so if mm -hmm. anybody uh, had to leave to work early or didn't get to attend at all, or if you'd like to pass this information on to anybody else, um, a link to the recording will be emailed in probably about a week's time. It looks like that we we don't have any questions and a lot of people are signing off. So thank you everybody for attending and thank you very much, Alex, for hosting and for bearing with me. <laughs> thank you, Mackenzie. And I hope that everybody has a great afternoon and enjoy the sunshine tonight. See you later, everybody.